Good morning, church. Have a seat. It is good to see you this morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church, Georgetown. And uh, what a joy it is to be with you. A credible week of ministry and energy and excitement. We're going to see if we can try and carry that into the service today. Uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. Let's say a prayer for our message. Today we're going to talk about who God wants us to be. And we're going to say some new things, I think. We're going to say some things I've been thinking about uh, to maybe broaden that definition for us. Let's see where it goes. Let's pray. God, we thank you for creating this space, for these moments, for the way this church body gets to come together and do things like an amazing VBS. Continue to encourage us and inspire us to be our very best for you, that we would listen to your invitation to be your disciple. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, friends, Theodore Seuss Geisel was born in the very early 1900s in Massachusetts. And in Dr. Seuss's early life, very early life, his dad... See, it's Father's Day. See, there we go. Father's Day, dad, okay. Uh, His dad was kind of a superintendent, volunteer superintendent at the local zoo. And so Dr. Seuss and his sister spent a lot of time when they were young uh, at the zoo and watching these animals and learning about these animals. At four years old, he would come home and he would begin to draw the animals that he saw. And the story goes that he wouldn't just draw monkeys and giraffes, but he would draw these creatures as he kind of put all of them together. Uh, One of them was called a wimp. It was called a wimp, needed more vowels. And its ears were three yards long. So four-year-old Dr. Seuss coming back and drawing these stories. Today, we're looking at Green Eggs and Ham. It was written in 1960 and is currently the fourth highest selling children's book of all time uh, behind The Cat in the Hat, which is number three. How this book came about is is a little interesting. There's a little trivia tag to it. His publisher uh, challenged him $50 if he could write a book that only used 50 words. And so that's where this book came about. There's only 50 different words in green eggs and ham. That's why there's a lot of repetition, why it's very simple. Apparently, back in that time, there was a list of two or 300 beginner words that you wanted to use in all of your uh, uh, children's books that you wrote. So he was challenged 50 words in here. Another fun fact, interesting fact, there was a group around the time this book became popular called Save the Pigs Community. Save the Pigs Community, one of our earliest uh, vegan support groups, I suppose. And uh, they were very discouraged that there's this popular book out there called Green Eggs and Ham. And so they made an offering, a suggestion. They were protesting and said, what if we called it Green Eggs and Jam? And that didn't work because it's still Green Eggs and Ham. So there you go. Uh, The main lesson from Green Eggs and Ham, as you may know, is is that there's value in being open-minded to new experiences and this willingness to try new things before we judge them. Um, This week, because of the life of ministry that we've seen this week, I want to head in a little bit different direction. I'm interested in the part of the story that most of us know about this guy named Sam, Sam I Am, constantly encouraging this unnamed man to do something. Would you do this? And the man says, no. And the man says, well, would you do this? What about if it was over here? What if it was on a boat or on a train or maybe with a goat? And the man continues to say, no, 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 and saying no to this calling that he's hearing from this Sam I am. But there's a moment in the story towards the end where the man finally says, you know, for so long I've heard you ask me to do this thing and I'll finally say yes. And in saying yes and in following through in eating the green eggs and ham, this man finds joy and this man finds 
something. So today I'm interested in calling. I'm interested in that voice that continues to invite us to be who we've been created to be, uh, this calling of of where uh, we're supposed to be in life and that moment when we say yes and we find our joy. Today, I'm thinking about annual conference that we just came back from. On Monday night of annual conference was ordination service. There were three ordinands that uh, were ordained over in the first Round Rock sanctuary, the way that they've said yes to a call that God's given to them. I'm also thinking about Camp Sunshine. There's a group of us from the church that are going to New Mexico this week to do an incredible ministry with adults with disabilities and uh, provide uh, a, a just incredible love and service for them. Thinking about our youth who are headed out on their youth mission trip here in about a week on this next Saturday. I'm also thinking about my VBS volunteers. Those of you that said yes to this question, would you be willing to do these things that some of you have never done before to see the anxiety on your faces that first day as you're thinking, oh boy, what have I got myself into? And then one day it rained and we had to change things and it was a lot of fun. What does calling mean? This churchy word that we've probably heard before, you know, I probably heard, well, you know, God's call, God calls Pastor Allen to be a preacher. I kind of, I've heard that before, but what does it mean to say what calling means to us? There's a book that people are invited to read if they're interested in ministry. It's called The Christian as Minister. It has a whole section on calling. I want to share a little bit of that with us this morning. It says, as United Methodist, we believe that when we are baptized, we are called into ministry on behalf of Christ. So at our baptism, and we might add at our confirmation, at that moment when we say yes to Jesus, when we make a commitment to Jesus, we are also at the same time called into ministry. That's when we receive our call. The, the sentence here says we are called. Um, the we is, is all of us. Um, the calling is not just for ordained clergy. The calling is not just for paid staff at your church. Um, the calling is for each and every one of us. Some of us remember, uh, do you remember that person, Oprah? Remember Oprah uh, on TV? And she'd say, look underneath your chair. You're all getting a prize. Everybody's getting a call today. You get a call and you get a call. Everybody's excited. You get a call. Um, that's the way God's call works in our life. You might say, why are we called? Why is it that God calls us? I want to look at two answers today. The first is that you were created for joy. You were created for joy. Um, you were created to find this place in your life where you're serving and you're, you're, you're finding that thing that God's created you for, and you find a certain joy in that. There's this image that I love to share. I'll share it one more time with us. It's an image of God standing at an easel with a blank canvas in front of God, and God is, is drawing the picture of your life. And God is standing there creating the, the things that will uh, get, get you full of joy. God is, gonna, is drawing the things, the way your heart is wired so that you'll find love, the way you'll be able to serve, maybe your gifts and your talents. And here's the deal, is that God is really, really excited about this. Um, God has a big smile on God's face. God's acting like I do sometimes when I have a little too much coffee in the morning. And just like, oh, this is great. Oh, and look at that. And yes, this, this too. This. And then God gets to watch you your whole life begin to discover what's on that easel. And it's not a one-time thing where you're like, now you see it all. But it's almost like a little portion here and a little portion there. It becomes a little more clear to you as you follow God's call. I think God finds great joy when the children figure out what brings them joy. And so no, the, the reason I think we have this call is that you've been created for joy. And God wants you to live that out and find that in your life. Another reason that uh, why we have a call is that you are invited to continue the story that God is working out in the world. 
you're invited to continue the story today on this earth. This story, this story that begins way, way back and includes a God that loves God's people and protects God's people and sometimes the people don't listen and sometimes they do and then, and then God sends Jesus Christ to be part of that story to find a new way to show love and to forgive and the story goes on and on. I don't find at the end of this book the word the end. The story doesn't end here, but the story continues through God's church. And the story continues through you. And you are invited to play a role in the story that is today. We continue to learn new things about who God is. We continue to see God in new ways. We continue to find new ways to love each other. Even today, even the ways they they may not have known generations and generations ago, we continue to discover it's the power of the Holy Spirit working in the church. Our lives are visible extensions of the life and ministry of Jesus. So the life and ministry of Jesus that we read about in the New Testament, it continues today through you. The reason we're called, the reason you're called, the reason all of us have a call is that you're invited to continue this story. But historically, we're very poor listeners. Historically, we're not real quick on saying yes um, historically, uh, we tend to resist. We're like this unnamed man in this green eggs and ham that continues to say, I will not hear, I will not there, no, 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 that's for somebody else. Maybe we catch ourselves saying, I would not, could not lead a prayer. I would not, could not join a ministry fair. Not in a small group, not a committee. I'd rather just watch from the pew if you let me. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. I'll be here next week too. <laughs> um, saying no is also our story. All throughout this book, uh, we find Moses. Moses, a great call. And Moses at the end basically looks at God and says, God, if there's anyone else that can do this, why don't you ask them? Um, Jeremiah receives a call and Jeremiah says, um, no, I'm too inexperienced and young for that, so find someone else. Saul, um, Saul, who becomes Paul, Saul is actively against the group that he's being called to serve when the call comes to Saul. Saul. It's part of our story to say no. It's part of our story to, to be the one that says, I would not, could not, no, I won't. A lot of times we simply think that a call is for somebody else. Our job is to kind of sit back and watch and encourage other people that are called. Uh, we're gonna encourage Laura because she's called to children's ministry and boy, isn't she just amazing at it? And so we're so thankful for the call that God's put on Laura's life and our role is just kind of sit back and then support it and say, good job. Um, no, no, there's a call for you. There's a call for each and every one of us. Um, it is never too late to hear your call and you're never too young to hear a call. And you're never too old to hear a call. And friends, there isn't a minimum amount of Bible memorization required before you can adequately receive a call. A call is for everyone, no matter how experienced or how new or wherever you might be. It is for all of us. This week, as I was writing down notes for this message, I wrote a line down, and I'm not sure I knew what it meant when I wrote it down, but I had to just kind of stare at it for a little while, and what I wrote down was kind of trying to a, like a goal of the message. The goal of the message was to take the shame 
out of call. To take, take the shame out of this language that we have in the church about calling. So let me see if I can explain that for a second. I wonder in the church if we spend a lot of time, maybe if we spend too much time, making this calling sound like what you're supposed to do is one specific thing, one job, one role. You're supposed to be located in a certain place. And until you get to that moment in that place, you're not doing what God wants you to do. I wonder if sometimes when we talk about calling, we take too much time talking about uh, people who have certain jobs and certain functions. And then until we're 100% figured out what that calling is, that we're not right. And so there's some, there's some shame that can be built into that because this isn't my first sermon about a calling. It's probably not the first sermon you've heard about God calling you. And we kind of can set it up where it's like, you need to be, keep listening and keep working on this because you haven't figured out what God's calling you to, to that exact moment and that exact thing and what you're supposed to do. I don't think that's the way life works because the situations of life continue to change. Where you're located continues to change. The, the situation around you, once you're a parent and, and then down the road you're a caregiver for your spouse and, and then you're, you're employed here for a while and if that's your calling, at some time you're gonna retire, does that mean you walk away from your, your call? We have to be careful about the language that we use. And I've been pondering this idea um, take the shame out of calling, because we, we like to talk a lot about mystery. We like to talk about the work that God does. There's some unknownness to it, and, and there's a lot of humility where we stand up and go, we don't quite know exactly what this is about, but we're drawn towards it. And we talk about relationship and the value of relationship and the value of unity and the value of us doing things together even more than being absolutely certain and absolutely correct and absolutely right in everything that we do. You and I, because we live in the year 2024, we're wired to want specific answers to everything. We live in a world where I can go to a computer and ask it a question and it gives me back a specific, perfect answer. We kind of want our relationship with God to be the same way. God, this really bad thing happened in my life. I need you to tell me exactly why that happened. I need to find a scripture that explains it all and, and lines it all out for me. We want this perfect answer, almost as if life is this, is this quest. And we haven't really figured out life until we're at this goal where we're holding the Holy Grail in our hands. And we say, I finally got there. I got all the way there. So here's my pondering. My pondering is I wonder if too much we talk about calling as a specific role, and I wonder if it's more of a heart direction. I wonder if what God really is calling us to is to the direction of our heart and the direction of who we are. And God is calling me to kindness. And God is calling me to generosity. And God is calling me to live a life of grace and love and to take off the selfishness that I naturally have and my own wants and desires to be part of something bigger than me. And God wants my heart to be directed in that way. And in, possibly that is the calling. That's what God's looking at at the easel and saying, yes, this is why I created you so that you'd have a heart that's directed towards the things of Christ. I think Jesus in Matthew would talk about that. This, this listening to your call isn't supposed to be an anxious, shame, guilt thing where you're not, you're not, you're not there until you got it all figured out. Um, the burden is supposed to be light, um, Matthew 6, Jesus is talking about what you're supposed to be seeking. 
What are you supposed to be going after? What are you supposed to be figuring out here? Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. John Wesley, uh, in talking about this way of salvation, it's kind of like a confirmation 300 level class. Uh, John Wesley's understanding of salvation is this process. It includes prevenient grace and justifying grace and sanctifying grace. Somewhere towards the end of, of his model, he talks about entire sanctification. He talks about uh, what he would call perfection in love and, and being, being perfect in love. John Wesley would say he never got there, but he knew people that did. And uh, what he's talking about there is not finding the specific job that you're supposed to be doing or... or or the exact thing that God created you for. But what John Wesley's talking about is, is truly understanding what it means to love your neighbor and to receive the grace that Christ has for your life. And, and that is the goal. Hmm. So, if maybe we were to take a step back from language of calling... and we release some of the anxiety around retirement and what job you've chosen and how you parent and instead we can let people go be parents and let those parents grow up to be caregivers and we can let VBS volunteers that come in a little trembly, unsure what's going on. Uh, we can let video game programmers go be video game programmers that have hearts directed towards Christ. We can have scout leaders that don't feel uh, guilty because they're not on a church committee, but they're sure serving the kingdom through the work as a scout leader. Um, I think it has to do with, with the direction of our heart. And that's something we can keep listening to. That's something that we can continue to be true to our call no matter where we are, wherever God has you situated in your life as the situations continue to change all around you uh, every year. So I want to encourage you to keep listening. Keep listening, keep being gracious with yourself. Keep finding those places that bring you that joy where you find that connection and possibly begin to continue to see that design that God has created you for. There's a quote uh, from Gilbert Melander. It was out of the Christian century. It says, and here's on the screen here for us, it is only by hearing, answering, and participating in the divine calling that I can come to know who I am. We are not who we think we are. We are who God calls us to be. So friends, let's be a church that's doing our best to figure out what that is. That it's not specifically what we're doing, but it's all of us sharing the same heart, headed in the same place, in the same direction. I can't stop the message without mentioning that there are those in our community that are being called to full-time church ministry. And I want to encourage you to ask those questions. Um, I'm on the other side of this now. I get to interview people as they consider their call. I get to interview students who are coming out of college that have been hearing this call since high school. I get to interview attorneys that have been attorneys for 15 years and they're thinking, you know, I just keep hearing that God wants me doing something else. Uh, the second career pastor is a, is a real gift to us right now. And so if you might think that maybe that's something you've been 
I will not, could not, would not in a boat or with a goat or on a car, in a train. Um, Maybe a yes is coming to you. And we would love an opportunity, a chance to talk to you, pray with you about that, help you discern um, that. Okay, to end our message today, and one of the reasons we're having this calling message today is to say a prayer for our youth as they're about to head on an opportunity for them to continue to listen through a mission, uh, mission trip to Columbia, South Carolina, because the East Coast isn't far enough to go for a mission trip. Uh, so let's do this. Those of you that'll be participating and they're leaving Saturday, would you stand up, please? I know we've got 33 youth and adults that'll be heading on this. I know they're not all here today. We've got vacations and things we're working out. Um, but congregation, let's say a prayer for them, a blessing for them. Um, God, we thank you for the many ways that this congregation finds to be the hands and the feet of you. We pray for these young people as they go on their trip, that you would speak clearly to them, that their ears, even though they may not be three yards long, might be open to hear from you. God, we thank you for creating each one of these students and we name that you love them so much, just as they are today, that God, they would hear that clearly and that they might respond to the call that you've placed in their life. Give them safety, give them joy, give them incredible relationship building and a pile of amazing memories to carry with them the rest of their life. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, thank you, youth. Good luck next week.